Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Linsky, and welcome to the virtual premiere of Hidden, the newest work in my ongoing project series, Zahor, which seeks to preserve the words of World War II Holocaust survivors through dance. For those who may not know, Zahor is a Hebrew word for remembrance. Over the past year and a half of this pandemic, my creative process for Zahor and these projects has been evolving in many ways. Of course, like many artists, the pandemic has limited my practice to some extent, working virtually, rehearsing and dancing from the constraints of our apartments, theaters being closed. But I have to say that many of those changes this year did give me the opportunity to slow down and focus in on creative process. I've been able to experiment with working more collaboratively with my dancers and taking time on Zoom to bring them into the research in hopes to ultimately better achieve my goals for Zahor to create an embodied Holocaust education experience. Hidden, which you will see today, is a dance film inspired by the story of Holocaust survivor Aaron Elster that I directed this summer through a residency at Chelsea Theatre Works. This choreography was created not just by myself, but through a very collaborative process with my amazing cast of dancers, Gabriella Amy Moreno, Imani Deal, Olivia Link, Mindy Fung, and Frederick Moss. All of the choreography has been threaded together by our very talented videographer, Olivia Moon Photography, Half Asian Lens. As we began to create Hidden, each dancer received and read in advance a copy of Erin's memoir, I Still See Her Haunting Eyes, The Holocaust and a Hidden Child Named Erin. Leading up to rehearsals, the dancers did this reading and when we began rehearsing back in April on Zoom, we did not yet begin dancing, but we spent time to discuss his story and the themes and topics that it evokes. Each dancer selected parts of his story and memories that most resonated with them and began to develop gestures inspired by those memories. Eventually, we did go back to rehearsing in person at the Dance Complex's beautiful new Canal Street location here in Boston or Cambridge. And we began to translate some of that gestural movement language into larger, more expansive movements now that we had big expansive space back. We got the attic prop, which you have probably seen now in some photos or promos or will see soon. And this attic structure really lent way to a whole new way of moving as we explored what it meant to interact with this structure, both physically and emotionally as we crafted this work. We continued to take time, not just to dance though, but to keep those elements of discussion and reflection. And we were very fortunate to have Aaron's son, Stephen Elster, who now shares his father's story as a second generation speaker, join us via Zoom for some conversations. Stephen has been wonderfully supportive and integral to the development of this project. He is here today. And before I show you the dance film, I would like for him to share a little bit more with you all about his father's unique experience. I'm going to pass it off via Zoom and switch to Stephen. And I will just ask for everyone to make sure that their um, computers are on mute as well. All right, Stephen, I'm gonna mute myself and switch over to you. Thank you, Rachel. My father, Aaron Elster, was born in Poland in 1931. He lived a normal, modest childhood. He played, he ran, got in trouble, played soccer and studied. His mother and father owned a butcher shop in the marketplace and they made good friends and connections. He was the middle child to Irene, the eldest, and little Sarah, the youngest. He loved talking to Sarah because she was so loving and giggled every time he talked to her, she talked to him. Around 1940, he was eight years old and began to hear rumors that soon they would be stripped of their possessions, their businesses, and someday soon be taken to labor camps, or worse, be exterminated. Soon German soldiers began to appear, and he began to feel terror and fear. 
becoming preoccupied with avoiding pain and death. People are disappearing everywhere. They're on food rations and now must wear a yellow Jewish star to show that they are Jews. He is nine, not nine years old now and the Germans are everywhere. The ghetto is changing, it's closed, it's fenced off. They can no longer go to school or go outside the ghetto. Going against these rules ends in death. There's human waste and garbage everywhere, dead bodies piled on top of each other. He's terrified at all that is happening around him. Where is God? October 10th, 1942, as they sleep, the German Gestapo, the Pol Polish police, and the Ukrainian soldiers surround the ghetto to begin the liquid liquidation. They are all rounded up to be sent to Treblinka for extermination. They're pulled from their hiding places and moved to the town center. His father tells him to run and he manages to crawl through a sewer to escape, running through the field, finding a barbed wire fence, crawling underneath it to his freedom. He's on the run for approximately two weeks and he finally meets up with his mother, but she gives him jewelry and tells him to go to their good friends and customer's home the Gorskis, where his older sister is hiding. His world is changing once again. He feels abandonment, fear, and disbelief. The Gorskis allow him to stay, but he must hide in the attic with minimal food and water. Days turn into months, and months turn into two years. He experiences extreme hunger and extreme cold and hot days are at times extremely difficult to tolerate. He's infested with lice, never brushing his teeth, and seldomly taking a bath. He's scared to death, but he knows he can't leave, nor will the Gorskis kick him out now because they are in fear of being turned over to the Germans for hiding a Jew. He continues to have intense feelings of despair and wondering all along, where is God? And what about his family, his father and his little sister, Sarah? Were they brought to Treblinka? And what happened to them? In his mind, he surely met, they surely met their demise. The only times he could use his voice, cry or scream was only with the occasional thunderstorm that would clatter so loudly against the metal attic roof. Two long years later, Liberation is upon them. Bombs are exploding everywhere and yet no one's in sight. And so he and his sister begin to run from farm to farm and then finally to, into a displaced person, person's camp. He and Irene begin to gain some of their strengths back. Their uncle Sam miraculously finds them and takes them with him as they obtain legal papers to come to the United States. First to New York, with the foster family, and then finally to Chicago. But his nightmares are still vivid and very strong as a teenager even. He still cannot let go of the hatred and anger that he held towards the Nazis, always thinking and wondering what became of his little sister, Sarah. Over time, he became a little bit less fearful, a little bit less anger, angry. He continued to be around people that helped him. Little by little, he regained more of his mental strength. As he grew older, he learned to release that anger. In his book, he says the following, hate destroys you instead of those who did the damage to you. So the result is that you are destroying your own life with the hate that burns inside you. A wise man said that anger is like a hot burning coal. When you pick it up to throw it at someone, it only burns you. Dad built a life and a family. He became a successful businessman, a dedicated father and a dedicated husband. He visited Poland several times attempting to find family of the Gorskis. His gratitude towards them grew over time. 
as he understood what they did to save his life. He would always say, my mother gave birth to me, but Mrs. Gorski gave me life. Ultimately, through organizations and contacts, he became empowered to share his story with others with hopes of educating future generations. Never again and be an upstander were his messages to young adults everywhere. Dad passed away in April of 2018, but he played a huge role in the building of the Holocaust Museum in Skokie, Illinois, and as the vice president, giving all that he could for the ultimate goal of educating everyone. You can still see him now at the museum's Take a Stand Theater as an interactive hologram, answering questions to all that ask.
Is another Holocaust possible? Look around you. Look at the killings that have been going on in recent years. When the Holocaust was over, we said never again, but that just became a phrase. Does the Holocaust happen? Could it happen again? Unfortunately, I believe it could, because if something bad happens in a country, they'll have to look for a scapegoat. And the minority is always the scapegoat. Sometimes I feel we're never going to change. We're going to continue to kill each other. And yet, I try to do everything in my power to instill some goodness in some young people that will hopefully make a difference, that will help change this world for the better. Thank you.
praise never again. It's not just about the Holocaust, but of course, that's what we're speaking about right now. It's about the memories, the presentations, the discussions, the difficult discussions. That is the key to becoming more insightful and to make things right. Our country, our people, across the world, we've made mistakes. There's no denying it. We've done things that we need to know we have done wrong and we have to fix them. But we're still being ignorant. We're not yet taking the responsibility or engaging and enveloping ourselves around those mistakes. It's not about agreeing with what happened. It's about accepting it and being able to learn from it and grow from it. But if we try to delete it, try to deny those atrocities, we're just going to keep doing the same things over. Hello again, everyone. Here, I'll put my camera on. Um, so thank you for coming. Thank you for watching. I would like to open up and have a Q&A, a question and answer session. I'm really curious to hear from you all as audience members. You can direct questions to myself, to the dancers, either as a group or individually. Um, I'll have all the dancers turn on their cameras so that you can see them and they'll have, you know, they have their names. Um, and you can direct questions to Stephen as well. Uh, I want to say, please do not be shy, whether you are a professional in the dance world or this is your very first time experiencing and witnessing contemporary dance. There are no bad questions. And I'm really curious to know from you all what is of interest to you, where you might have questions, um, what resonates with you. We will be developing this work hidden further into a live evening length performance this spring of 2022. Um, and I'd really love to be able to incorporate some of the feedback questions and just finding out what interests you into that process as we further develop this work. Um, before we begin our Q&A session, I will say, um, as you all know, this event this evening or afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from, is free of charge, but if you would like to make a tax deductible donation to the continuation of Zahor and that development of Hidden into a live evening length work, you can do so through my fiscal sponsor, the Boston Dance Alliance. I am going to have my lovely design and production assistant, Andrea Sofia Sala, send that link in the chat if you are interested in making a donation. Um, I am going to start off the Q&A. Um, 
I'm curious to hear from the dancers, whoever would like to answer. Um, this was a new creative process that I was trying out again. The pandemic did lend way to trying new things and a lot was on pause as far as most of the performance world goes. We could focus on creative process a bit more. Um, and this was a newer thing, mixing Zoom rehearsals with in-person rehearsals and mixing not just physical dancing, but a lot of time spent reading and discussing and reflecting. So I'm curious to hear from you guys, whoever would like to speak, um, what that process was like for you, because that was that was a new that was a new thing for me. You can raise um, your virtual hands or you can be on camera and raise your hand in real life. And for those who may have questions, you can type them in the chat or again, raise your virtual hand, raise your hand on camera, whatever you like, I'll, I'll find you on the screen. So to the dancers, what was it like for you being part of this process that is a mix of time on Zoom and time in person rehearsals and a mix of not just dancing, but time spent reading, discussing um, and reflecting as well. Gabby. Um, I was definitely the quiet one of the group during our research time, uh, but this is my third project, I think, within Zahor, Rachel, and um, the most different one, and I really appreciate it, enjoyed um, the different um, As I said, we started on Zoom, um, and we started with this book and other um, articles, and I, I think it made sense for the work. Um, we all have like different levels of understanding um, the Holocaust, like some have learned it about it extensively as some barely just depends on where you went to school and how much you looked into it. So I think it was great to have like this foundation, this like common language for us to pull from and to create from. Uh, and yeah, we, we worked on like smaller gestures within our spaces. And then once we got into in, in person, it got to be more expansive, which, yeah, I just enjoyed how it like, we like researched a lot and then like exploded in person. So, yeah. Thank you, Gabby. I see Olivia, you have your virtual hand too. So I'm gonna spotlight you and mute myself. Yeah, uh, this was a really enjoyable experience, I think especially when, you know, performing um, an individual story that has so much weight and significance, it's really important to also have this deep research and discussion process that we did, um, which is why, you know, talking with Steve, reading the book, discussing the group, uh, the book with the whole group was really important. And it made this really difficult and challenging role a little bit a little bit easier but not definitely not that easy because <laughs> so it's a hard thing to do but I definitely appreciate and value this process Oh, uh, Rachel, I didn't hear you call on me, but I feel like I've been spotlighted. So sorry. Yeah, I just went through. I was like, I had no need to switch it back to me. I'll just do the zoom motions. This is Mindy. <laughs> Go for it, Mindy. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, to add to that, it, it did feel like a big responsibility. It's a it's a really um, dark and uh, terrible story. And I think there are times where it felt like um, like, you know, we wanted to do right by Steve and his dad. And, um, but so I think it really helped to, uh, Steve said something in one of our conversations towards the end that was really liberating. And it was, um, Steve, you told us just to perform in a way that felt really authentic to ourselves and, and that um, portrayed what we got out of this experience. And so I think it wasn't about, you know, regurgitating a story. We had this huge experience so that we can internalize it through reading, through movement exploration, through improv with each other. And we like 
really just embraced it and explored it and made it personal to ourselves in a way that felt really deep and authentic. And um, hopefully that came out in the piece, but it was, it was a real privilege to engage in the work in that, the, the piece in that way. So thanks, Steve and Rachel. Now I see Steve, you have either a question or an answer. So I'll let you take it. All right, thank you. Uh, so basically two things. Um, actually one of my relatives is, is on and they asked a little bit about the song, the music, uh, the lullaby by from Propachek and asked how that came about. Uh, we collaborated together on it and discussed and thought it was a, a good uh, piece to be using. And the fact that uh, my grandmother sang that to both my cousin's mother, Irene, and my father, Aaron, uh, held a lot to that. I don't believe many people know this. Uh, there's a few that may be online that were at the, uh, the bat mitzvah of my daughter and she sang the lullaby while my youngest daughter played the piano and it was a tribute to both my aunt and father at that time. So that has deep meaning to me and to, I think it was Gabby uh, who said uh, about the interpretation, even reading the book, people need to interpret and understand different pieces of that whole era, whether it comes from my father or any survivor and the significance behind it. And the fact that history can repeat itself. It's important to understand that these things can happen again. And when you interpret and understand that, you do make it your, your own and you have your own feelings towards it. I can't tell you how highly, uh, how, how highly I respect the dancers, Rachel, all of you who have put this together because you've made this real. And I, I mean, I'm so proud of you guys. Thank you so much, Stephen. I see Sky K. Henry Smith. I'm gonna um, allow you to ask your question. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Oh, so sorry, I'm working on Zoom. It's never going to be perfect, no matter how many months we've been on this. Let me see if I can find your screen. All right, I'm gonna spotlight you so you can ask your question. Or actually, I can't spotlight you without the video, but I think um, unmuted, you can go ahead and ask, Guy. Thank you, Rachel, um, and to the, the rest of the team. As, um, as I watched the premiere, I noticed that there was an expansion that needed to happen inside of me to make room for the pain that was the anguish even that was so beautifully presented by the dancers and it made me wonder what was the emotional cost for the dancers who said yes to this project if anyone wants to speak to that i would i would value hearing their feedback That's a really good question. I don't know if any of the dancers, if um, you can raise your hand. I know we talked a little about a little bit in the creative process. Um, and as I develop a creative process for these projects that best can work towards achieving the goals of Zahor, um, I have worked and tried to figure out, you know, how do you, you need not just for dance, you need a physical warm up, And then often if you're smart about not getting injured, you take a physical cool down too afterwards. Um, and recognizing that for this work, we also needed an emotional warm up, an emotional warm down or cool down afterwards as well. Um, I can say, it's definitely, we, we did a lot of um, 
writing and reflecting and tried to keep a document of running notes so that we could easily come back in back out of this work. Um, but it's definitely something that as a choreographer and director, I admit, um, I'm working to figure out what the best approach to that is myself and I'm curious to know from you guys what worked, maybe what didn't work because this is research. Um, and yeah, any thoughts that you guys have on that? Imani, I'm gonna send it to you. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think that for me personally, um, this process felt like a very safe space to explore and question and relate um, all the different aspects that really like weighed heavy on us. Um, we had to read the book before even coming into the rehearsal process. And the book itself is very, hard to read, I would say. Um, it's not an easy story. And I feel like once we got into the rehearsal process, we, Rachel really provided us the space to kind of go through what we read and how like surprised we were and how, you know, it, we thought it related back into things we've dealt with, things we can see that are going on in the world, things that, um, not it wasn't like a, a single vision that we had to view it and we were able to kind of see it all in our own different ways um and express that and i think that really helped us when we were putting it into movement because we could really embody not only physically but mentally what was going on and how we um interpreted the piece and the book and the story um so yeah Thank you, Imani. I'm gonna send it to you, Fred. Let me ask you to unmute and spotlight. Yeah, so I guess in addition to like the emotional warm up, um, one of the other sort of like key parts of this entire process for me was just when Stephen came into the, the mix of conversation. And I guess also in sort of like addressing uh, Lori, Lori's comment or question in the chat. Uh, when Stephen came into the conversation, uh, to me, it changed my perspective and sort of like slant on uh, and, and reading his, his father's um, story from this like sort of dark and lamenting or uh, sense of despair that I would have to warm myself up and be prepared for emotionally. And just it turned into almost this inspirational thing where it's like, sure, the school systems aren't really doing a great job about talking about any Holocaust survivor stories or just like any education around the Holocaust in general, but just the simple fact of like having um, um, a close relative or any relative of a Holocaust survivor like be able to give their perspective and like their slant and or their, their impact um, was really inspirational to me uh, and gave me a little more liberty to bring more joyfulness to it um keeping the narrative alive keeping these stories alive so um yeah uh, sort of a, a three-pronged <laughs> answer but uh that was a key part of this entire process for me and and i think something valuable that we kept talking about like how do we keep these stories alive and i think this is a, a great example of how we're doing it since the school systems to my knowledge aren't doing a good job so Thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, I definitely agree. And I have experienced that too, even in planning these works. And I spend a lot of time reading things and researching things. And sometimes it does start to, you can feel it taking a toll. Like if you just consume your mind with dark stories all day long. Um, and sometimes it is really helpful to also be able to think about not just some of the details of each emotion that can be a little bit more tolling to embody, but to um, kind of think back to like the goals of this project and of Holocaust education this work to keep these stories alive. Um, I think for me that definitely helps and it's it's really nice to hear um, for you Fred as well that that was able to remain um, kind of like a, a positive and an uplifting, the up, more uplifting side of like we study these tragic um, parts of history and we're working to keep them alive. Um, 
let's see. I see your question in the chat, Lori, about um, if there's movement to address, you know, various school boards on more Holocaust education. I don't by any, I, I don't know the answer to that personally, but um, one thing I will say, and a big part of starting this project for me, I grew up and went to Jewish day school, Solomon Schechter day school, where we studied the Holocaust all the time. We had a lot of Holocaust education and we were at the generation where um, most survivors were the generation of people's grandparents. And they were a bit more ready at the time to share their stories rather than the generation of their children directly underneath them. I, from what I'm gathering through these projects and talking to people and talking to Steven, sometimes it's, it's a little too soon to tell to your kids or you want to maybe spare them of that experience that you had. But um, at my age growing up, we were able to hear from a lot of survivors and many people's grandparents. Um, I was asked a question on a trip at one point in college if we had studied the Holocaust in school. And my initial reaction was, of course, we studied it all the time. And I realized it was only at Jewish day school that we studied it, not in my public high school, even though I grew up in a town and that high school had a lot of Jewish people there. Um, never really in college either. Um, and it, it really made me think um, why Holocaust education is sometimes so concentrated in Jewish communities, because in those strict Jewish environments, I found that we did study it a lot different than public school, what's required of education. Um, but it made me think about when you were only studying your own people's history and we sometimes get in those little bubbles and it can be hard to break out of that. So while I don't know what, um, what efforts are being done as far as public school education, um, I think that kind of that place where it was lacking definitely um, was a big part of me wanting to start this project and begin this series. Karin, I'm going to send it to you. I'm going to spotlight you. OK, thank you, Rachel, for this wonderful project. I just have a couple of things to add. I'm not sure what has happened to the Facing History program that was studying the Shoah. And it was begun, I believe, in Brookline. Uh, and it used to go to a lot of the public schools. So um, I don't know, all of my grandchildren are well past now, uh, that age. And so I don't know what they're doing in the schools, whether anybody is doing the Facing History Project. I'd be very interested if anyone in the audience knew, uh, but I don't. But I know it was at one time and it was supposed to be geared not just for Jewish day schools, uh, but also for public schools, for wider audiences, uh, so that the story became universal, uh, not a story only confined to a particular group of people. So, and my other comment is I was deeply moved by the dancing at the beginning. I felt the pain, I felt the gestures, uh, not just of suffering, but of frustration and confinement and helplessness um, that were not generic or cliched, but I really got not just beautiful choreography, stunning choreography, beautifully performed, but a deep emotional commitment that radiated through movement which is, I think, very important, especially when you're dealing with something, a stories like this story. Where I began to get confused is when it got to a wider group. I wanted a bridge in there, some sort of bridge. I would gather people one by one to make them come together, rather than moving from those gorgeous solo dancing where the emotional impact was so powerful into where I'm looking more at beautiful dancing for the group, but I'm not aware of the emotional impact the way it was when I was focusing on two different individuals. So there is a place 
in this development that I would suggest that the movement from the individual stories to the widening of applicability, bring people in, not into a big group right away. Let them come from their own different places and then find ways to find each other and find the difficulty of it because it isn't, you know, come by eye. I mean, this is not an easy thing, not an easy thing to talk about. It's filled with guilt and recriminations and anger and rage and self-pity and all sorts of things, complicated things. And certainly Jews are not the only people who have suffered. And as I used to say to my Brandeis students, suffering is not a competition. I mean, that is, it's a universal affliction and we need to find one another. And I would like to see in the dancing that you do, and I really respect it, Rachel, I would like to see that place in between those deeply felt two different dancers and then bring more people, let them interact, let them moving solo to duet, to trio, to quartet, to widening before we start talking about, well, you know, end of art, hello. And ever again, over and over and over, we keep saying ain't too hard. It's, it's become absurd now because it does keep happening. And you're not there to analyze or to try and um, solve that. You are there to show that within these stories are the seeds of compassion and connection. And that's, I want to see that bridge. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Karin. I actually think in um, what you just said, you know, we're not there to solve it. Um, it's not within our capability, but it's that within the story, there are those seeds of compassion and connection. Um, and Sky, I see your follow-up question in the chat. I think that's probably, while it's not so much of a defining moment of what birthed this passion, um, I definitely do think that constantly studying these stories in school growing up definitely taught a very strong base for empathy and understanding that you have to be able to take um, these stories and other stories similar to this, um, of ostracization, oppression of minority groups, and be able to empathize across those different groups. Um, I think that's something that I really value that I had gotten from having so much exposure to Holocaust education when I was younger. And I think that it was really important in, um, in my upbringing. And I appreciate that, that part of my education for it, for sure. Um, if I were to say a defining moment, um, probably when I went off to college and uh, the school I went to, I was uh, probably the first Jew that many people had ever met in North Carolina. And um, I had realized that many people did not have any experience with Holocaust education or that inherent respect for these stories and pieces of literature um, that I had grown up with. And it was perhaps just whether their schools taught it or not. And I saw an opportunity by creating the first work in this series um, of Zahor, which was titled, Do I Want to Remember, to bring dancers and non-Jewish dancers um, to create a work. And it was presented initially in Yom HaShoah programming uh, at the school I had gone to. And um, because of that, instead of just bringing the Jewish community into that Yom HaShoah programming, I was able to get a lot of friends and peers of my own and friends of the dance program into that programming that they otherwise wouldn't have come to, but they were coming to see this work and what their dance friends were performing in. Um, and I think that was when I really uh, I guess a defining moment when I realized the potential that the combination of those things had. I see another question in here from Maya Schwartz. I'm going to take a moment to read it if that's okay. Um, but dancers or anyone, if you want to raise a hand and share reflections or continue as I read.
I'll read it out loud. When we talk about art as a form of remembrance and the weight of telling and retelling stories, I wonder if not just in a world where the educational remembrance of acts like the Holocaust is diminished, but also artistic education being lost. I, for one, as a Jewish person, did not see conversations about the Holocaust in my American school until late high school, but that was also paralleled by the loss of artistic programs and funds for arts. How do we support not only the continuation of telling the stories that shapes us, but also teaching the mediums, dance, music, art, writing that tell these stories in a world where that is continually less prioritized? especially given less patronage given COVID? That's a really great question, Maya. I think um, my dancers and I had some similar, similar conversations about, um, I guess, the difference between different types of ways to study history. Um, and maybe you guys want to answer on this topic. Uh, it's similar to what we have talked about in the sense of what makes this type of education resonant and in Holocaust education and education of other of these tragedies of history, it's not just about the Holocaust, but what can make that more resonant in school? I think, um, yeah, I don't know, you can take a moment to think, but I'm curious to hear from you guys what you think. Imani, I'm gonna send it to you. Hi. Um, I would say, um, personally, it was less of um, it was less resonant to me when I learned about it in school, like the Holocaust, because there was a lot of data points. Um, you know, the amount of people that died and um, kind of like the areas that things occurred, but I didn't really get anybody's story, and I'm so grateful to have been a part of this um, Zach Core process for three pieces because I've learned so much about the Holocaust and Jewish traditions and um, things that I would have never learned. And I went to public schools um, all throughout Boston and the greater Boston area. And I, I would say like reading stories and there was even a movie that kind of touched on it when I came out when I was a little younger. Um, that gave me more of that emotional connection and resonation that would make me want to dig a little deeper into learning about the individuals who actually went through it. Um, you know, that human connection makes it more resonant. And I would say like, if they were to put, um, you know, as a reading book, you know, Aaron Elster's story as a, you know, for the high schoolers, I think that would resonate more with um, public school curriculum. Sure. Mindy, I'm gonna send it to you. Let, oh, oops. Sorry, I keep switching my screens here. There we go. Now, just to add to what Amani said, um, we did talk a lot about the difference between being presented data points and numbers and data um, versus personal stories and the importance of storytelling and um, because of that emotional connection and. I think that um, this is gonna sound maybe very obvious and I'm a little embarrassed, but I, it, whenever Rachel first um, told us about this project, she's like, I wanna do this because the Holocaust is not a Jewish story. It's a, it's a human story. It's relevant to everybody. And I was like, oh, <laughs> which like speaks to my past education. But um, I think it's, it's the humanizing aspect that makes it relevant, that makes it such that everybody can relate, empathize, and take action. And so stories do that in data in a way that data can't. Thank you, Mindy. Um, let me come out to here. Are there any other questions, Steve? And I know we've also talked about in conversation that idea of history and getting a lot of numerical information. I don't know if you have anything you wanna to add to that as well. I think, Mindy, you hit it 
very succinctly, or it might have been Amani. When you're learning about history back in the day, we're looking. We're we're learning about data points. We're learning about numbers. We're 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 not really being challenged to learn about the stories, about the emotions, and what you guys have provided is a a, a jumping board. This was enlightening. It was enticing. It was. Uh, it was mysterious. There were things in there that you're like, oh, I wonder what that meant. And if somebody would have read the book and then watched you guys perform, you can pick out certain actions and gestures of what, for instance, my father was going through. That's real. That's history. We don't have enough survivors and they're they're leaving us in left and right now they're just they're, they're passing and you know it's second generation speakers and others that are trying to bring that connection back uh and, and it isn't about the numbers it those are not the lessons to me that we should be learning it's the stories it's just to reiterate that i think our school curriculum needs to be improved based upon that because we can connect more that way we can personalize things as fred said so there's there's a lot of interaction and understanding what it was really like and you guys have provided some of that and again we can only do so much in our education system and they have to say, you know, in 1812, this is what happened. Those are numbers. But what happened before that? What happened to lead up to all these things? What were the emotions? What was happening? And it doesn't feel like we're getting that out of our curriculum. And locally, where I, I live in Illinois, locally, I think Karen was talking about it. I forgot what the name of the program was. And I don't recall if that's the program name locally, but there are uh, curriculum being taught about the Holocaust. Uh, they do br bring in guest speakers, survivors uh, in the springtime, usually around the time. So the momentum is not quite there, and it's certainly not across this country, but then in pockets. And believe it or not, I, I grew up in Skokie. I don't know, you know, 98% Jews there. I don't know. It was some huge number. We never learned about the Holocaust. Not one program, not one lesson, nothing. So we've come, we've come a distance. We've made some changes. Thank you, Stephen. I think, um, and my dancers have heard me say this uh, probably a few times now in our different conversations, um, but because I do have such strong memories as far as what we studied in history in school, and I'm sure there's a lot that we studied that I have forgotten about. I actually went through a bunch of old binders that I have at my parents' house earlier this year, um, and I did. I found lots of history binders and stuff that, honestly, looking at it, I was like, I didn't I don't remember learning about this. I didn't know that they taught us about this, but I do always say that I remember so clearly learning in history about the Holocaust and about slavery. And I feel like on those two topics in our history classes involved a lot of stories, firsthand accounts from people, documented stories. I don't think that numbers, I'm sure they taught us everything that they were supposed to in school or just about you know a good amount of what they were supposed to. But now as an adult, when I look back on it, what really resonates with me, and I can be sure that yes, they definitely taught us that in school, I know that they included that, is the stuff that was more rooted in stories. And I know, Imani, you had said, when films, any type of literature and art, even if it doesn't give you the grand scheme of the numbers, it tells you a story and it, it, that is what resonates with you. Um, yeah. 
I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Eddie or Edie? I'm going to spotlight you. Okay. Am I unmuted now? Um, yeah. I was, I was very moved by the piece and the beautiful dancing and, and the mournful music. I mean, it was, it was, um, it was very memorable. And I agree about the, the stories um, make people's, make all of this much more real to people. Otherwise, you know, time passes and, and, and it's not. Um, and I, I was also struck, I don't know, was that Steve speaking? There was a paragraph at the end of, um, um, at the end of the dance. I, I don't know if, Rachel, if you wrote that or if Steve wrote that or, or, or who did. And of course, it seems so applicable to here we are on the 12th of September. Um, it seems so applicable to, to now as well. But um, I anyway, I want to thank you all. It's been really a, a remarkable and memorable and I which I remember uh, performance. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So indeed, that was Stephen speaking. That was um, a recording from a conversation between Stephen and the dancers from one of our Zoom conversations. Um, what a what a wonderful way to to end, um, to end the piece. You know, I I I I, I thought it was just very fitting and and timely. So. I think, I you know, think it, <laughs> it was a candid conversation with everybody and Mindy pulled me aside or later, whenever follow up was and said, I like what you said. And of course, now I had to remember what I said, which was challenging enough, uh, but we put it together and was that Edie that was just speaking? Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're so right. I do my best to keep, uh, political conversations out but if you take a look at the country you take a look at the world and you see what's going on just in general I'm afraid I'm afraid history is starting to repeat itself this scares me I I loved what you said about that people need to to learn um, and and I actually thought it just so fitting that this is this is the day after September 11. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's a, it, that's a very good point. We have to learn, and we we have to do more than learn. We have to learn. We have to understand. Again, as Fred and others pointed out. You make some pieces of this your own, you interpret it, you own it, you feel it. And maybe at that point, a person, even on this Zoom, a bell will go off and they will take action and they will do something over and beyond, be inspired by the dance and by the interpretation, by my father's words. That's key. That's what we need in this country and in this world. We need people to take action as opposed to just learning. Thank you, Stephen. Thank um, you. I know, Edie, you had commented on um, how it ends with uh, Stephen's voice. And um, I know I had mentioned that we will be developing this further. Um, and the prompt that we had been talking about in conversation um, with Stephen was that phrase, never again, that we hear a lot. And Karin, you had said it too. It, it's used, the phrase is used. And if you just say it, it doesn't necessarily hold, it doesn't call you to act, it, it's uh, ah, speaking. Um, it's supposed to call you to action, but sometimes it seems easier to just say never again. And I've seen it. I've seen, I'm sure we all see on like social media, sometimes just about never again, just as like a post as it is. And we've talked a lot about how there needs to be something more than that. Just simply saying words um, 
two words isn't enough to actually work towards the goal that is behind that. So that was Stephen's reflection on never again in that phrase and what it means to him. And the dancers have some reflections on that um, as well that I'm hoping to use as we continue to develop. And um, just as we've been talking about education in schools and the power of art, um, be it poetry, literature, dance, um, visual arts in this type of education um, in the process of developing a live evening length work this coming year. Um, I really hope to bring in some even, even younger dancers. Um, we're young adults, but I'm hoping to work with some teenage dancers and have talked with Steven about um, hosting some workshops with some virtual component to meld Holocaust education and dance and some choreographic tools for younger dancers as well so that they can go through a similar process that my dancers have gone through for this process and to hope to include them too. Um, especially knowing Aaron's goals to really touch young people with his message, I think, um, and it is, you know, it's hard to take a story like this. There's a lot of weight to it and you want to do it justice. Um, and I think that that is a really important part of it. And while it doesn't change what they're doing in public schools, as far as Holocaust education goes, I at least hope to be able in this coming year for the first time to bring some teenage dancers and students into a process like this as well and learn what it is like for them. Are there any more questions, reflections, anything anyone wants to share? Carmen. Hello. Um, I just want to say that number one, and congratulations, and I'm super proud of you and all of your cast and Olivia and Steve for sharing your dad's story. Um, it was obviously amazing and great, so you know that. Um, <laughs> but I, I was sitting and watching and thinking about how, um, how in a way I felt like it mirrored a little bit of the experience that I had with you in the series that was uncovering and like how that reflects like uncovering versus hiding kind of situation. Um, and yeah, and uh, choreographically I was looking at like the beginning gestures and how that process was similar to ours. And I was like, again, that same, same findings that we had choreographically on a virtual setting, fully virtual, that was our Zoom setting transforming into a whole like dance film I was like yes <laughs> um but yeah other than that um that was like my own obviously my my own personal like yeah okay yes dance um but on top of that it it brought me back a little bit to that like those reflections and those thoughts but in a new site because um I remember like and I think honestly that that experience I had with you will stick with me for a very long time if not forever um, just because again, I, it goes back a little bit to that education aspect. Like I did study quite a bit about the Holocaust and many other, uh, genocide kind of situations that have happened, but they are facts that I know that I had to memorize for a test. You know, it's like the years, the dates, how many, what, and like, there's no real touch and a story that is one out of millions, you know, like so many stories, so many people that could have, um, experience and share differently and all these things and um it's it's really incredible how again the way that a story is told changes completely the way we feel about it and the way we portray it and interpret it and keep going with our lives honestly because um it it's again it's a different way of perceiving um empathy it's a different way of in general, just looking at people and seeing people and not numbers and figures and, um, but yeah, that's my little twisted rant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Carmen. That's really great to hear. For those, um, I think many of you, and I know Stephen has also recently shared it again, back in February, um, leading up into this, I did a research project and bought, brought in a bunch of research assistants, some uh, undergraduate students in performing arts, some recent graduates in performing arts, um, and 
basically, you know, again, we're on Zoom. The performing arts world is different. It was entirely virtual, but took the time to experiment with what that would look like. Reading a book together, uh, developing gestures and solos at home, working within the constraints of our apartments. Um, and Carmen was part of that process. Um, and I'm sure you noticed too, and it was a question someone had asked in the presentation in February, like, did you notice any overlap as individual dancers develop gestures and movements informed by this story? And with our starting group of seven or eight dancers who were my research assistants in that process, there was overlap and there is overlap still in this group of dancers compared to the first group I worked it with. I'm sure when I do this with younger students too, ultimately this year, there will be that overlap as well, which is really interesting to see I feel like it's easy. It's I feel like I'd commonly see it in writing, but can like see it authentically in something like that. How universal the language of movement is that even when you take very different people, very different bodies, people with very different experiences, um, people may choose to communicate things through their words differently. Um, but there is a, something very universal about the way that we embody certain emotions um, and we're probably more connected in that way than we think we are. I've definitely seen that in that process and it's nice to hear that you have seen that as well. Thank you. Is there anything else that anyone would like to share? Steven. Oh. I'll let you unmute yourself. There you, there you go. go. Yeah. Uh, one quick question. Um, I noticed that there was a movement that you all did, or maybe most of you did, and it was on the floor, and you were in a circle. You were turning yourselves in a circle, almost as though you were running, maybe, and not getting anywhere. I'm just curious why that was a repetitive movement. Was there anything to that? At so, all? oh. That is a great question. Um, it's derived from the movement that Fred had developed. Can I spotlight you, Fred? Would you like to take it away? Yeah, so um, when I to respond to any portion of the book, uh, basically we, we got this prompt of choose a section from the book that like most resonated with you. And it was like having a hard time trying to pick any portion of it because I'm like I haven't lived anything close to this experience before um, but one of the things that stuck out to me was a portion where uh, basically it's this endless cycle night after night of like not being able to sleep uh, thrashing and like waking up from being hungry and just that going on forever and ever and it's like well I haven't had that experience exactly but I have had like restless nights I've had been hungry before thrashed in you know my sleep before and whatnot uh so that was the thing that I picked out and it was also the thing that was like this has the most like gut wrenching and just like guttural experience uh, that you know um was provoked in me and so that sort of movement like thrashing and sort of running your sleep and just waking up from pain uh it, that that movement was derived from that and then to find out in the conversation uh uh with Stephen like that was also something that continued well into the later years um of his dad's life and like things that would wake his mom up right and it's like oh I have to keep him at a broom's distance right <laughs> otherwise he's gonna like knock into me or something so um yeah that's where that movement sort of originated from <laughs> Thank you. I think in our uh, creative process too, especially in making a transition, which was really interesting from Zoom to in-person where each dancer had developed a solo based on what resonated with them. Um, I, it was very interesting um, when each person kind of shared what they had chosen and you know, each were these memories that were haunting Aaron, these nightmare-esque memories. And Fred's happened to be this like very fitful circular night of sleep. Um, and at least choreographically, it was like, it just felt very meant to be that like 
Well, if everyone is representing these different haunting memories and these different haunting nightmares um, and Fred had chosen the fitful sleep, it seems like a very, um, it made a lot of sense as a way to tie it, um, as a way to tie it together. Um, but again, it was just, it's just chance based off what had resonated with each dancer, what each dancer picked. Um, and yeah, it was really interesting to then find out how much of a how big of an element those nightmares had been uh, even after Aaron had come here to the US and was starting to build up his strength again. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Of course. All right, everyone. I will, of course, if you have any um, closing thoughts or things you'd like to say, you can raise your virtual hand or just raise your hand on the screen. Um, I think I will begin to wrap up, but um, I just want to thank you all so much. I want to thank Stephen and all of the dancers, um, Olivia Moon Photography, my wonderful videographer. I think we should give her a hand. She did an awful lot of work and she's really, really wonderful and talented. Um, and I feel very Lucky to have collaborated with such an amazing team. Thank you to Andrea, Sophia Sala for helping me out with so many different things and Jason Reese who built the attic. I would also like to include that Mindy Fung, one of the dancers is the one who designed the attic, which was especially cool when we began to talk about that, um, to have one of the dancers, someone who knew that they would be dancing in it, who knew what they may want to try out in it, uh, use her skills from outside of dance to design that. Um, such an incredible team. I'm really grateful for you all. Thank you to Chelsea Theater Works for this residency. The dance complex for the residency at Canal Street for our rehearsal space it was very important to have a space that would let us store the attic somewhere. Can't cart that back and forth each rehearsal. That's that's definitely tricky. Um, and thank you so much to the Russell J. Efros Foundation for a generous grant that allowed us to produce this project and this film. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. And Andrea is sending a few notes here. If you would like to copy or to buy a copy of Aaron's memoir, you can contact Stephen directly. Um, I'll be sending out that information in an email. Um, considering no one uh, messaged me midway, I'm hoping that the video quality came in well. I know sometimes Zoom is tricky, so I'll also be able to send out a YouTube link to the film if you would like to rewatch or share with someone. If your internet cut out at any point, this program today has been recorded. Um, thank you all so much. I'm very grateful to you all for being here um, and for taking part in this conversation as well. Thank, thank you, you, Rachel. Of course, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.